I'm Margaret Ann Takashewski, Director of New Haven Museum, and we're so glad to welcome you to tonight's talk. The story of the three regicides is woven into the fabric of our city's history and city war. And their names are on our streets, Dixwell, Goff, Whaley. Their hiding place, Judge's Cave, can be found atop West Rock. And their likenesses have graced cigar boxes, matchbooks, hotels, restaurant menus, and, and other memorabilia over the years. We even have a comedy improv group, The Regicides, and you may have caught their recent performance with the Broken Umbrella Theater. Um, so, and several years ago, we presented journalist Christopher Pagliocco, who was the author of The Great Escape of Edward Whaley and William Goff. So tonight we will hear about John Dixwell, a deeply personal story for our speaker, who is his direct descendant. The museum's association with Sarah Dixwell Brown goes back at least 10 years when she was first, she first came to our Whitney Library to research her famous and notorious ancestor. And we have eagerly awaited the publication of her book, Regicide in the Family, Finding John Dixwell. We have signed copies available here at the museum for purchase. So please come by or email us um, on our info line. And apologies to those of you who may have tried to reach us this week. The museum has been experiencing technical difficulties with our phones and internet and our server. And we're slowly getting ourselves back online with our IT support. So thank you for your patience. Um, before we begin, can I ask that you please put your questions for our speaker in the chat so we can all see them. And a little bit about tonight's speaker. I ask that you please put your questions for our speaker in the chat so we can. Um, tonight's speaker, Sarah Dixwell Brown, received her undergraduate degree in English from Harvard University and her master's in English literature from Stanford University. Over the years, she has taught writing at Stanford, at Santa Clara University, at Mount Holyoke College, and the Commonwealth Honors College at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She has published numerous personal essays in national and local publications, and she also plays the flute and enjoys hiking. Please welcome Sarah Dixwell Brown. Okay. Well, Hello, everybody. I can't see you, but I'm delighted that you're here. And um, first, I want to just thank the wonderful staff at the New Haven Museum who helped me with my research over many years and have been kind enough to invite me to speak tonight and help with the technicalities of getting the word out and running the Zoom event itself. What's important about my particular quest to learn all I could about John Dixwell, who is my seven greats grandfather, is that I didn't know he existed until I was 28 years old. This is very strange because he was part of something huge. <clears throat> he was one of the 59 judges of Charles I who found the king guilty of betraying his own people and sentenced him to death. So I think my shock on learning about him and my puzzlement and almost resentment that my father had given me Dixwell as a middle name, Dixwell was his grandmother's maiden name, but chosen to say nothing about him had the eventual effect of lighting a fire under me. Here's how I did find out about John Dixwell. When I was 28 years old, I had the opportunity to, to do research for my master's degree in the reading room of the British Museum, which now that whole collection is in the British Library some blocks away, but it was just the most beautiful building in the most beautiful room. And I was having a perfectly wonderful time there because I love Virginia Woolf and E.M. Forster and I was writing about the Bloomsbury group. But the thing about Stanford University was when I was there, they called the master's program, the terminal master's program, which does sound like kind of a disease, doesn't it? And they didn't really care whether we wrote a paper. They didn't really care if we did um, oral exams. They just kind of wanted us to pay our tuition and give us our degree. So I had been told by my professor, he didn't really care if I wrote the paper or not. So I spent a few weeks being really conscientious. And then I thought, I'm not going to write the paper. What am I going to do instead? So it was a fabulous library with a gorgeous card catalog. I started looking up odd names in my family. First, I looked up Wigglesworth. I'm also directly descended from a Puritan preacher named Michael Wigglesworth, who wrote really depressing 
very popular poems called for um, little Puritan children in the 1600s with names like Day of Doom, No Feather Bed to Heaven. So I found stuff about him. And then I thought, well, what about Dixwell? I wonder if there's anything on Dixwell. And lo and behold, there was a book by Ezra Stiles, who at the time was the president of um, Yale College, it was called back then, in 1795. He had written a book about these three men who had been part of getting a king killed, Charles I. And out of the 59 people who signed the death warrant, I have the death warrant behind me here. This is a fake tourist copy of the death warrant. The actual death warrant definitely doesn't have a pen and ink sketch of Charles I on the top, but um, Oliver Cromwell's signature is there, and Edward Whaley and William Goff, who are the other two who fled to New England, and John Dixwell is signature number 38. So it is a facsimile of the, of the signatures, but it's definitely not part of the real death warrant. So um, I, I started reading about it and I just went into kind of a panic. I, I was really kind of horrified. So I thought, well, I can't really be related to this person. I, I can't, I mean, how obscure is that? But then I read that he'd settled in, in uh, he came to New Haven and his son settled in Boston where I was born. I thought, oh, like, maybe I am, but I really had no idea. So I, um, when I went home some months later, it was 1980, so there certainly was no way of communicating with my parents. I said to my father, Dad, I, I found this John Dixwell, who was like a regicide of a king. We're not, we're not. And my father goes, he hangs his head like this. And he went, yeah. And then there was this awful pause during which I felt as though it was the worst thing in the world to be related to this person this murderer, and then he said direct descendants, as if it was really totally depressing and horrifying and awful. So that happened. And then um, 10 years went by, and it turned out that dad had something else, a number of things. So he had this, which I just showed you, but he also had the key to Dover Castle that John Dixel had brought him when he fled. And he'd never said a word about that either. So I'd like to read you a little bit about the moment that I got the key. Dad did not seem excited when he gave me John Dixwell's key. There was nothing ceremonial about the moment I became the ninth generation to receive it. Dad appeared in the kitchen where I was helping mom peel potatoes and he had something in one fist. You might as well have this, your name is Dixwell, he said, his tone apologetic, as if he was about to burden me. He handed me something surprisingly dense bundled up in a plastic produce bag from the local supermarket. It was recycled, of course. My parents, who'd lived through the Great Depression, reused aluminum foil and string. I put down my potato peeler and took it. Who knows if I even washed my hands, you should have it, he went on wearily. You're the one who's found out the most about John Dixwell. I could see he felt guilty that he didn't know more himself as if his 12 hour a day schedule as an editor and an orthopedist should have left him time to do genealogy. What is it, I asked. He didn't answer, just waited as I opened the bag on which was printed in orange and brown, the Fruit Center Marketplace, a shopping adventure and pulled out the big rough iron key. Good heavens, said my mother. It isn't every day your father gives you a 17th century key to a castle in England. Several moments went by before I remembered to breathe. Here's an odd thing though. You might think that it's being a key to a castle would have aroused my curiosity. I might have wondered why John Dixel had the key to a particular castle and what he did there but it didn't occur to me to wonder, nor did dad say anything about it. Instead, my eyes were fixed on the word on its yellowed label, the word I'd learned for the first time in the reading room of the British Museum. Regicide, I said aloud. King killer, I added, as if we needed the definition in order to grasp the severity of what our forebear had done. Dad shook his head ruefully 
and I felt a mix of awe and horror. Something about holding the key in my hand and reading Epps's notes brought the execution of Charles I right into the room with us. John Dixwell really had done that. I really was his descendant, for here was his key passed down through 300 years to me, his namesake. So if um, you make it to the end of this presentation, I'm gonna show you the actual original archival plastic produce bag, and I will pull out my key and wave it around. So I hope you can stay until that moment happens. But the thing is, I at that time, I really knew nothing whatever about 17th century England and how the world got turned upside down in the years leading up to the formal execution of Charles I in front of one of his own palaces. In case anyone in the audience also doesn't know much about it, here's a little summary of what led up to the trial. After Charles I became king in 1625, his largely Protestant subjects began to worry about his French Catholic wife, Henrietta Maria, and the royal couple's love of fun. Puritans wrote pamphlets denouncing the lavish musical theatricals staged for the king, his queen, and nobles. They were appalled when he reissued in 1633 the Book of Sports, which authorized various forms of recreation on Sundays. A Protestant lawyer, William Prynne, published a criticism of the queen dancing and called female actors whores. He was sentenced to life in prison and had his ears cut off. Nevertheless, numerous sects of Protestantism proliferated. The more radical of their members determined to root out what they saw as idolatry verging on Catholicism, smashed stained glass windows, and destroyed priceless art in cathedrals and in the homes of royalists. The turbulence did not shake Charles's belief they ruled by divine rights. As king, he was second only to God in the great chain of being ordained by God since time immemorial with everything from angels to earthworms to minerals in appointed places. Charles thought absolute power over his subjects was not only his right, but his duty. To subdue resistance to his increasingly tyrannical policies, he instigated not one, but two civil wars against his own people. To fund the wars, he levied various capricious taxes that drained the country's resources. The loss of life was probably higher than that of the First World War. Unpaid troops plundered freely. Impoverished citizens were required to house soldiers from both sides of the conflict. Wounded war veterans begged in the streets. The weather was terrible. Crops failed. Let's see. But even in the very, very beginning of my search to learn about John Dixwell, despite my initial dismay, I found myself feeling defensive of him. In the 1908 edition of the British Dictionary of National Biography, the writer of Dixwell's entry is withering in a way that made my hackles rise. That's on page 21, let's see. He said, In pedigrees of the family, he is usually ignored, as, for instance, in those contained in Burke's extinct baronetage. And he is also passed over in the account of the Dixwell family given in Halstead's Kent. And sure enough, when I found family trees in 1980 in England, John Dixwell's name wasn't in the family tree. They had removed him from the family tree. And then the, the contempt kind of continues to this day. I felt aggrieved recently when I was reading the British historian Adrian Tinniswoods in his 2013 book about the Rainborough family. He has this to say about my man, John Dixwell, who had been undistinguished until he signed the King's death warrant, remained undistinguished. What? That's on page 307 of his book. But in fairness, Tinniswood has a point. John Dixwell was a small fish compared, say, to Edward Whaley and Edward Goff, the other two regicides who wound up in New England after the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the beginning of Charles II's mission 
to bring his father's killers to justice. During the 11 years that England had no monarchy, Whaley and Gough served Oliver Cromwell as major generals. They were so close to Cromwell, they were at his deathbed. Dixwell was a mere colonel. He was down in Kent a fair amount of those 11 years, not in London. He probably wasn't fond of Cromwell, but nevertheless, he was part of something world-changing and profound. And I eventually concluded, was very brave to choose to serve as a judge of his king and live forever after with the enormous consequences of that choice. Here's my summary of the big picture of John Dixwell's times as I described them in the ch first chapter of my book. Human history is full of times when people resorted to violence in their desperation to affect political and social change. In the United States, we have had our own Revolutionary War and then Civil War, the first to throw off British rule and the second to end slavery. Gradually, a gradual diplomatic means had not worked. In 17th century England, the people who felt it imperative to end Charles's despotic rule decided slowly and reluctantly that the only way to stop him was to kill him. It wasn't their first choice or even their fourth. For years, Parliament had tried to come to agreements with the king. By the time they brought him to trial, the country had been through two civil wars and considerable chaos and suffering. In a way, the regicide was just one in a sea of dramatic changes. It was a time of fascinating ferment. In the wake of the Protestant Reformation a century earlier, new religions sprang up and people questioned having a state-sponsored church. In the decade before the king was killed, there was an explosion of uncensored publishing of opinionated pamphlets. It was an inexpensive, it was inexpensive and easy to spread new ideas. A young generation of lawyers brought their skills to contemplating not only how to limit or abolish the monarchy, but to restrict the powers of the state over the liberty of individuals. Ideas of religious toleration and checks and balances on the powers of the king, parliament, and the army were ahead of their times. But a century later, they would inform the American Revolution. The framers of our own constitution benefited from looking back both at what had and had not worked. So let's see. I spent decades researching and writing and rewriting the book. I didn't know for the longest time that the New Haven Museum had all the letters Dixwell received in exile, as well as legal documents he drafted himself. Nor did I know that they'd been given to the museum in 1889 by my great-great-grandfather, Epps Sergeant Dixwell. At that point, they'd been passed down through many generations of Dixwell descendants for 200 years. So I'm gonna start this slideshow now and show you this is Epps Sergeant Dixwell and he was the one that decided when he was really quite old that he shouldn't be keeping these amazing papers anymore and he decided that they really needed to be in New Haven because New Haven is where Dixwell lived out his life in exile. This is um, one example of the incredible collection that the New Haven Museum has. You see, this is John Dixon's signature, and there's his alias, James Davids, and there's his red sealing wax with the same coat of arms stamped on it that is on his next to his signature on the death warrant. Oh, let's see. I will return to New Haven and its treasures but first I'll tell a little about my journey to find out all I could about John Dixwell's childhood, his education, what may have radicalized him, and his flight from justice in 1660 when Charles II was restored to the throne. Although I had been an English major with no formal training in history, I soon became obsessed with the idea of primary materials. No doubt I was inspired by owning a fantastic piece of concrete evidence the key to Dover Castle, but I wanted more. I suspected 
I might have to go to England to find whatever records of John Dixwell's life still existed, but that was a daunting prospect. And of course, there was another thing. My writing group, who had been suffering with my many drafts of the manuscript for too many years to count, began insisting that I take the key back to Dover Castle and try it in the lock. You, in case you don't know, Dover Castle is a military fortification, not a fancy castle, but a, mil a beautiful military fortification overlooking the English Channel, which is where invaders have always come from France across the English Channel right into Dover to, to conquer England. So, um, I just kept saying, I can't, it's too hard, I'm scared. And then I was complaining about how scared I was to my student. I was teaching a Korean student named Mi Jung Kim. I said, I can't, I'm scared. They say I have to take the key back. And she said, well, why don't I go with you? And it was kind of a terrible moment because it's like the minute she said that I knew that I had to go. I had to go for her sake as well as mine, as well as for the sake of John Dixwell's story. So it happened. I started emailing complete strangers in England, professors, librarians, archivists, and every one of them was incredibly kind and helpful. And many of them agreed to meet with me and teach me what I needed to know in order to understand my seven greats grandfather and show me whatever they had in their collections. Somehow I was able to schedule them all into two weeks in May. Mi Jung and I got on a plane and we arrived in London. So let's do the next slide. Here's Mi Jung at the Pen Club, which is right around the corner from um, the British Museum, where I'd first discovered the existence of John Dixwell. She was the best traveling companion ever. So the first day we got there, we were so exhausted that we just had to go look at everything. So we went and found Lincoln's Inn, which is one of the four inns of court in London where you, you can read the law. John Dixwell read the law for seven years and did complete the work and became a barrister. And so those are the gates to Lincoln's Inn. They were probably there when he was there in the 1630s. And this is the Royal Courts of Justice right down the street. And this is these are the best hinges ever for the Royal Courts of Justice. You can see it was getting late our first day. And then right around the corner is Chancery Lane, straight, straight out of a Dickens novel. It was just fantastic. The next day we got up and we found Cromwell right outside the Houses of Parliament. And we were asking and asking, we wanted to find out where nearby Charles had actually been beheaded. And nobody seemed to know when we looked and looked, but finally we found Whitehall, the banqueting hall of Whitehall Palace. And Charles on the left of that picture is where he was beheaded. And here he is. And what that says underneath the, the tablet, it says, his Majesty King Charles I passed through this hall and out of a window nearly over this tablet to the scaffold in Whitehall, where he was beheaded on 30th January, 1649. And oh, the feeling I got when I read that. I knew that when he was beheaded, people had rushed the scaffold and dipped their handkerchiefs in the blood. And to this day, I'm sure there's people all over the world, if certainly England, with bits of cloth with Charles's blood on them, which they used to heal people, that he became a saint that day. There's a chapter for Saint for um Charles the the martyr. Um and, and there's a, a chapter in New York City. I think they have 400 members. So then I went up to far up into the north of England to Pontyland and the little church where John was baptized. And this is the church. It's way in the north of England. And then I went to um, the Woodhorn Museum in Ashington and got to see the actual record written in his father's hand of John's birth in 1613, the actual piece of paper. And then I went to Lincoln's. Oh, so that's the inside of the church where Edward Dixwell, the father of John Dixwell, was the vicar until he died when he had six children under the age of 10. You can see his name there next to 1602. He was the vicar until 1616, which is when he died. So that's when things get interesting for John Dixwell. And I'm because the family got scattered, John and his older brother Mark were sent down to live with their incredibly rich uncle, 
down in the south of it down in Kent, really far from where they've been born. Like a, it feels like a different country. It's so different. And that Uncle Basil Dixwell inherited so much money that he built this gorgeous building where I spent two nights. It's called Broom Park. So John Dixwell lived there for um, 18 years. In particular, he lived there so he could be the um, guardian for his brother Mark's five little children because Mark was killed in the first civil war. They both fought on the parliamentary the parliamentarian side, not the, not the king's side of the civil wars. These, there's, there's my little key, and those are the ceremonial keys at Dover Castle, where I met with archivists. The keys are 22 inches and 19 inches long. Mine is only six inches long. And I tell you, those archivists were so excited about my key. They were practically purring. They were, we drank tea for five hours and talked and laughed. And then they took me to the apartment that they thought my key would have unlocked, but the door is no more. But this is the governor's apartment where John Dix would live because he would have been responsible for keeping watch over the channel and, you know, being responsible for all the troops. It's called Constable's Gate. And that little balcony is where he would, you can stand to look over the channel. And the date 1644 is carved into the wood. And John Dixwell was the um, governor of Dover Castle in 1659 and 60. So he definitely stood on that balcony. Here's just a view of the side of beautiful Dover Castle. Let's see. This is the church in Barham near Broom Park where John Dixwell would have been buried if he hadn't signed the death warrant. He would have been buried with his uncle Basil inside the church where rich people got to be with Mark and his little niece, Alice, who died at the age of two. But instead, he's buried in New Haven. This is right behind Center Church. This was his first gravestone. It has only the initials JD because he was afraid that the stone would be desecrated by British soldiers. And indeed it was during the Revolutionary War. I'm assuming they urinated on it, who knows? But Ezra Stiles wrote with shock and dismay about how they did things too terrible for him to write in his book. And then, um, let's see, what's my next picture? In the mid-1800s, my great-great-grandfather, F. Sergeant Dixwell, had these two brothers, George Basil Dixwell and John James Dixwell, who made a ton of money, I'm sorry to say, smuggling opium, only they didn't call it smuggling, into China during the Opium Wars pretty terrible way to make money, but it gave them enough money to make this gorgeous four-sided obelisk for their, I don't know how many great grandfather John Dixwell was to them at some point. So this is a house in Hadley, which is the first place where John Dixwell showed up in the new world. And it, this house is from 1745, but I'm guessing he stayed in the house of the Reverend John Russell where he, he somehow found out that Whaley and Goff were already being sheltered in a, in a house like this, and he joined them in 1665. These are the fields around Broom Park where I got to walk when I spent two nights at Broom Park. And these are the fields of Hadley. And I wondered if they just, if I wondered if it wasn't somehow a bit familiar to him. This is a sheep on the land that Dixwell that the, the Dixwells owned out around Broom Park. This is a calf in Hadley. This is the notation. What, what John Dixwell did was he, he left. Whaley and Goff were so important and hunted down. They were never caught, but they had to keep hidden their, their whole lives to such an extent that nobody knows to this day where they're buried. We don't know where their bodies are. But John Dixwell was a smaller fish. And so he was able to go down to New Haven and change his identity to James Davids. And he married, and let's see, I wrote this down to read to you. He moved to New Haven and he married not once, but twice. His first wife was Joanna Ling. She and her husband, Benjamin Ling, a childless couple sheltered Dixwell, now James Davids in their home for we don't know how long 
When Benjamin died, Dixwell married Joanna, and she died not long after. This left Dixwell, whose funds must have been running very low in the many years since his flight from England, with a house, land, and quite a bit of money by New Haven standards. Um, he married young Bathsheba Howe several years later, and they had three children. John Dixwell became a father for the first time at the age of 66. He was so excited, I think, that he noted little Mary's arrival in the margin of a letter from his niece, Eliza, the only Dixwell back in England who remained loyal to him. And so what this is in the New Haven Museum's collection. He, he wrote, on, I think he was so excited, he, he, you know, he blotted the ink a bit. He was, I bet his hand was shaking. On the ninth day of June, be, being the second day is covered up, I can't finish. My daughter Marie was born and he has the exact hour and minute um, in the year 1679. And I just think he must have, it's pretty neat to become a father when you're a regicide and you've been on the run for years at the age of 66. I'm descended from their son, John Dixwell, who became a noted silversmith in Boston. So unlike my father, who um, couldn't bring himself to tell me about John Dixwell's story or the fact that he owned Dixwell's key to Dover Castle, Hadley celebrates the regicides to this day. So they have this sign on Route 9, right near a Chili's and a Stop and Shop. And they mention the regicides Goff and Whaley were concealed for 15 years in the pastor's house. They name streets after them, Russell Street for the minister and Edward Whaley. And then there's Goff Street, also on Russell Street. Here's the tabletop grave for um, John Russell, the minister. And they're getting kind of ruined by acid rain. So this wonderful person made a brass plaque in honor of, of John Russell. And I should say that the whole town could have been killed for hiding the regicide, but they, regicides, plural, but they kept the secret and nobody was ever caught. Um, now we're in New Haven and you can see in New Haven, three streets mentioning all three regicides. And I showed you earlier, both John's original modest gravestone and the fancy 19th century obelisk at the, back, at the back of Center Church, but there's lots more behind that church than Dixwell's gravestones, as I will show you shortly. When I was doing my research, I was curious about why, why my ancestor had chosen to leave the quiet farm community of Hadley for the New Haven colony. Here are some of my thoughts about it in my book. Let's see. John Dixwell spent a quarter century of his life in the New Haven colony, living there even longer than he had at Boone Park. It was time for me to learn about the place. Compared to Hadley, which was in his infancy when he showed up, it was only about three years old. New Haven was old for the new world. It had come into existence in 1638 when Theophilus Eaton, a wealthy London merchant and the Reverend John Davenport arrived with 500 English settlers. Davenport was a powerful and popular Puritan preacher who had emigrated first to Holland and then to Boston in his frustration with the situation under Charles I and his bishops. But Boston's brand of Puritanism wasn't rigid enough for him. In New Haven, he would strive to create a biblically inspired perfect community. Davenport served as the minister and Eaton became the governor of the fledgling colony. The two men purchased a 10 mile square of land from the Quinnipiac tribe for 12 each of the following items, 12 coats of English trading cloth, 12 alchemy spoons, 12 hatchets, hoes, porringers, and also two dozen knives and four cases of French knives and scissors. They agreed to protect the Quinnipiacs from the Pequots. The Quinnipiacs taught them their ways of hunting, fishing, trapping, and planting. The English gave them diseases that nearly wiped them out. Up in Boston, Increase Mather saw all that death as proof God favored the English. Quote, God ended the controversy by sending the smallpox amongst the Indians, unquote. In New Haven, when the tribe tried to buy back some of their land, 
because they couldn't grow enough food to feed themselves, the English refused. Davenport and Eaton laid out the town in nine squares with a central square known today as the New Haven Green, where Dixwell is buried. They had the purest theocracy in New England and the most tyrannical. No one but church members could vote. They got rid of trial by jury, as it wasn't in the Bible, and they turned away people who didn't meet their standards. They treated Quakers violently. So there's one other thing I want to read. Let's see. The thing is, um, but that, you know, so for John Dixwell, it must have seemed very different from this wealthy, wealthy situation and well-educated situation he'd been in in England. But Bathsheba, his young wife, was grew up in New Haven, so it was all she'd ever known. <coughs> Here are some of the things that happened during Bathsheba's life in New Haven. Under John Davenport's theocratic rule, not even his co-founder's wife was immune. He excommunicated Anne Eaton for questioning his stance on infant baptism. For the rest of her years in the colony, people were required to shun her. Unsurprisingly, she returned to England as soon as Theophilus's death freed her to do so. The harshness was not confined to adults. New Haven's misbehaving children could, by law, be hanged. Thankfully, there's no evidence any actually were, but over the years, many were required to stand in the town center with nooses around their necks. Bathsheba, born into this rigid, exclusive little world, had no exposure to anything else. To her, fines and floggings for minor infractions were life as usual. Normal, too, were limited schooling opportunities for women. As a child, she may not have known that back in England, women with means could be educated. That's one reason Anne Eaton and Anne Hutchinson up in the Massachusetts Bay Colony got in so much trouble. They had good educations in the old world. Both boldly expressed their views in their communities, in their new communities, became influential, and then were severely punished. In New Haven, John Davenport did his best to silence women. Boys were taught various subjects, but girls, the colony decreed, need only to learn to read so they could study the Bible. Up until her marriage, Bathsheba might have read nothing else. Okay, what else can I show you? This is the back of the um, church, the, uh, the, the um, center church on the New Haven Green. And you can see on the lower left, Dixwell's grave with an iron fence around it. And then right between his grave and the back of the church is Theophilus Eaton's huge memorial. I don't think his body is there, but I'll read you what it says on it. it the syntax is so tangled that I'll read it really slowly. Eaton, so famed, so wise, so just, the phoenix of our world here hides his dust. Oh, maybe he is under there. This name, forget New England, never must. This name, forget New England, never must. Just behind on either side of the back exterior wall of the church are tablets honoring Whaley and Goff. I asked the church about them and learned this from the church historian. First of all, notice here, this thing for Eaton was put up in 1938, you know, really quite recently. It turns, and there's another thing about Theophilus Eaton on the back of the church. So there's one for Whaley and there's one for Goff. And so I wrote the church and said, when were they put up and what are they about? Did their families put them up? And she she wrote back that um, the regicide plaques, as they are known, were dedicated on October 6th, 1935. They are Works Progress Administration projects, you know, under FDR created and federally funded under the city of New Haven's federal art project and were designed by artist Salvatore Milliki and Peter Santos Saldivar beginning in 1934. I just, I would love to know why New Haven in the 1930s got so interested in, in Eaton, Whaley and Goff. But I just love it that all three regicides and the first governor of the New Haven colony are honored on the New Haven green. 
but even better is what the New Haven Museum has, namely the entire one-sided correspondence of Dixwell's years in the New World, where he was the only regicide to marry because Whaley and Goth's wives and children were back in England and they never saw them again. It also has all the indentures he wrote in his efforts to get back money and land in England because he never gave up hope he'd be able to return there and raise his family there. But instead, he died of congestive heart failure, just as it might have become safe for him to return in 1689. Bathsheba was left to raise their two surviving children, Mary and John, on her own. She never went to England. Here is her gravestone in an ancient burial ground in Middletown, Connecticut. She outlived her regicide husband by 40 years. The museum also have this, has a silver snuff box. My great great grandfather, Ep Sergeant Dixwell, donated along with the letters in 1889. And he thought it belonged to the regicide. But Pat Kane, who's a silver expert at Yale, told me it couldn't have been his because it's an 18th century thing. I haven't been to the judge's cage, but the museum has the original of one of the paintings of the judge's cave. So I'm gonna ask Patrick to um, pop up that picture right now. Since the book's um, publication, more exciting things have happened. In John Dixwell's will, he gives his sword to his son, John, who became a noted silversmith in Boston. Maybe he was the maker of that snuff box. I just found out a second cousin has what he was told is Dixwell's sword. Here it is. It's hard to know after all these years if it really was the regicides. I asked a very kind historian in England whom I've gotten to know via Twitter. His name is Stephen E. Barrett, and he wrote me, it's difficult to say, to be honest, it looks like a small sword, a gentleman's sword worn for dress occasions and about town, not for war. It's very long. I don't know how he fit it in his trunk. I like, um, let's see, worth, but it's certainly worth investigating further. Lately, more and more Dixwell descendants are coming out of the woodwork who know things I don't. A distant Dixwell cousin who lives in Cheyenne, Wyoming, heard about my book, emailed me, and is now contacting Dixwell cousins in California, Rhode Island, Georgia, and Colorado. Maybe they have John Dixwell things like the seal with which he stamped his coat of arms into red sealing wax on the death warrant and onto the indentures he penned in New Haven, or the books he gave his daughter Mary, or the tweezers he gave to his son John. I like to think of more and more Dixwells everywhere reading my book, learning what I discovered about our common ancestor, and then embarking on their own quests. It's time to stop. But first, let me return to my wonderful time in England in 2014 as I was researching for my book. Often, I walked through Tavistock Square where I visited Gandhi and thanked him for finding a nonviolent way to gain independence almost exactly 300 years after the regicide of Charles I. Then I would stroll over to Virginia Woolf I had abandoned the Bloomsbury group that long ago day in the reading room of the British Museum in 1980. But because of that, I had discovered Dixwell. What, to use her term, a moment of being that was. Wolf's To the Lighthouse is among my favorite novels, and she got the idea for it right in Tavistock Square. It says, this is at the bottom of that bust of her. Then one day, walking around Tavistock Square, I made up as I sometimes make up my books, to the lighthouse in a great, apparently involuntary rush. No such luck for me. Who knew it would take 40 years for my book to come into being, but I don't regret any of it. My last slide is a portrait of the final John Dixwell in my branch of the family. He died in 1931, childless. Today, although many people have Dixwell as a first or middle name, as far as I know, there is no one on the planet with the surname of Dixwell. I'm grateful I was able to tell the story of the first Dixwell to come to the new world, fleeing for his life. I don't want that story to disappear as it disappeared in my branch of the family ever again. Thank you.
So should I stop the share now? All right, sure. Yes. Yeah, we can go ahead and stop the share and uh, we'll see what we have for Q&A. Thank you so much. Lots of thank yous in the chat. Round of applause. Thanks. And let's see what we have for questions. Um, Bev wants to know, on his death, was there a will and have you seen it if it existed? Yes, he wrote a will. And I did see the actual will. I I saw it in, in, in Hartford, Connecticut, in the in the Connecticut State Archives. There are wills yeah. of everybody. Bathsheba, the the Lings, Benjamin Ling and Joanna Ling and Bathsheba's parents. It was fantastic. Yeah. And also we see... state inventories too. So I, I was able to see the entire contents of John Dixwell's house at the time of his death. Awesome. And uh, I see our next question is from Doug. And he says, my last name is Wally. Whaley. My oh. ancestors are from Yorkshire. Uh, all, all the Whaleys I have contacted in England, Australia, and the U.S. pronounce our name Whaley rather than Wally. See, there we go. Do you know how it was pronounced? I, I just, for some reason in my head, it's Whaley, but, you know, maybe it should be Wally. I have no authority on that one. And the next me. question. So, so is, are you, is that person descended from, from Edward? He had we'll have to see, Doug, women. if you want to write that in, go for it. I've and been our, contacted by a number of people who are descendants of other regicides um, who are here and in England. Yeah. I see another question here is, have you been to the Judge's Cave in New Haven? I have not. I need to drive right down and do it. And I saw a question here. Where is the key now? Oh, but, but I should also say that um, John Dixwell wasn't in the Judge's Cave. That happened before he arrived. Dixwell and Whaley, I mean, Whaley and Goff got here in 1660, the minute Charles went, was on the throne. And Dixwell first went to Germany, so he didn't get to the New World until 1665. I promised everybody I'd show them the key. So here's the plastic produce bag. And I will reach in. I have to keep it in there in honor of my father and his peculiar wrapping techniques. And here's the key itself. It's really pretty big. Wow. And um, have you had any contacts with the descendants of Whaley or Goff is the next question. Not really. I mean, uh, well, I, I have a high school classmate who is a descendant of Whaley, but she doesn't live anywhere near me. But, you know, she read the book and I've been having so much fun with people reading the book. And this is sort of these questions sort of go together, so people want to um, see the key again. I, I'll put a put something behind it so it's more visible. Does that help? There. Nice. And I'll sort of give you these together as a block. These questions are: Can you explain the whole regicide thing again briefly? Which sort of goes with this question of uh, at what point did they transition from being reviled to revered? So I don't know if you have any extra thoughts you want to add on that in addition. Oh, I do. That's a great question. They've all been good questions. Um, it, it's I realize, you know, Ezra Stiles is writing this book saying, you know, how fabulous they were and they how, what heroes they were, whereas they've been reviled up until the American Revolution. And I think it was it was because of gaining independence from England, all of a sudden, everybody could be proud and excited instead of trying to hide the fact that they were related to these people. So, and, and you know, a lot of people, historians do feel that the regicide kind of laid the groundwork for the American and French revolutions. You know, the idea that, that kings didn't have divine rights, that, you know, every gov government should be for and by the people. And Lucy would like to know where in the north of England was John Dixwell born? And did you ever find out how he was radicalized? Is there anything in the letters he received that gave any sense of what was going on in his mind at the time? Well, 
he was born in Pontyland, which is north of um, Newcastle upon Tyne. It's way up, it's almost in Scotland. Very cold up there and dark. I think he was radicalized during his seven years at Lincoln's Inn. The most radical thinking was going on at Lincoln's Inn right during the time that he was there for seven years. I think he was probably also radicalized by the the death of his brother. That has to have been just an enormous, I mean, he, both his uncle and his brother died within a couple of years of each other. And his brother died in the Civil War. So, and in, I think too, like, what did he have to lose? He you know, he didn't have any family left in his generation. And, you know, he had, I'm assuming, when, when, when some evidence of his radical thinking is even when he was old and dying of heart failure, he was still writing these really radical people in Holland and in England. And they called the whole idea of a republic as opposed to a monarchy, the good old cause. And he was still holding on to the good old cause as he was dying. He never, ever back down from believing that that was the form of government that he wanted. He wasn't very happy with Oliver Cromwell because the first England was, it was kind of a republic for the first few years after the regicide. But then as Oliver Cromwell got more and more power, it, it was called the protectorate. And, and all, in his own way, Oliver Cromwell was pretty tyrannical and a lot of people were really uncomfortable with what Oliver Cromwell was doing. He did terrible things in Ireland, terrible things in the Caribbean. You know, he, he was a very charismatic man. And, you know, I'm sure he did some good things, but it was a mixed bag for sure. And I, I, um, Dixwell sort of disappeared during Cromwell's heyday. He just was doing sort of smaller county offices down in Kent, I think, rather than being in London, where all the action was taking place under Oliver Cromwell. Now, after... Cromwell's death, did any other regicides escape the wrath of Charles II? Yes. Some 20 or so had died during the 11 years that England wasn't a monarchy, so they were safe. They caught and drew and quartered about 10 of them in really gruesome ways. Um, several of them escaped to um, Holland and then Germany. John Dixwell lived in Hanau, Germany for several years. But George Downing, who's the guy that um, number 10 Downing Street for the prime minister is named after George Downing. George Downing had been in the first class at Harvard and he was the chaplain for um, either William Goff's regiment or somebody's regiment in, in, in the civil war. So on the side of the parliamentarians, but as soon as Charles II was in power, he um, made a lot of money catching regicides who had been men that he'd been their pastor. So I think it was Samuel Pepys said that, called him perfidious, called Downing perfidious. So yeah, um, they, they, they didn't kill as many as you imagine. I think they only killed about 10. And the three in, in New England never got caught. Edmund Ludlow was the last one to die. He was hiding in Vevey, Switzerland. So, yeah. And then these questions uh, are both book questions. Um, it says, a member of Princess Diana's family wrote a book partly about the regicides. Uh, and so is that a book that you know of? I, I see it looks like you have props, yes. <laughs> and also Act of Oblivion by Robert Harris is the other one. That but he has, um, Charles Spencer has quite a few mistakes about Dixwell. He, he, he didn't have his facts straight about Dixwell. Um, I have read Act of Oblivion. Yes. And he says that, that you know, that Waylon Guff didn't, didn't like Dixwell. He has them disliking him as they're in their little hidey hole in, in Hadley, Massachusetts, which is probably true. I bet that they didn't really like each other that much. On the other hand, it has to have been extraordinary to get together after all that they've been through and being fugitives from justice. So maybe they actually were, were happy to see each other. And, and the story of Waylon Guff is actually very sweet. I mean, um, it took a, um, Whaley was much, he was Goff's father-in-law and he got sick and um, Goff tended, tended him. He, he nursed him to his death in this little secret place in the minister's house. And there's, we have some letters that he wrote describing how, how sweet 
and gentle Whaley was as he was became gradually unable even to dress and undress and or feed himself. It, it's amazing. Um, it's, it's that all that stuff is in um, Christopher Pegliuco's book. He lives in Connecticut. He's I met with him. This is a really interesting book. And then there's this book, The King's Revenge, a British book. And then in 1968, there was a children's book, Molly and the Regicides, which is set in Connecticut. And um, finally, this book is really interesting, Charles the I, Killers in America. This is a, a British man who wrote this book. And it's his argument is that, that Charles II wasn't really that committed to capturing the regicides in New England. It was just sort of theater to some extent for him. He, he makes some good points. He also says that he, that's from this book that I learned about this book. And he said that the reason that this book and in general, all the operas and things that were written about the regicides in New England, there were tons of operas and novels that used the story of the regicides in New England died down because suddenly the idea of killing your leader became very unpopular after the assassination of JFK, Malcolm X, Robert Kennedy, and, and um, Martin Luther King. And so this came out in 1968, which was pretty bad timing for writing about regicides. And I thought he made a very good point about that. that you know, people sort of shifted away from romancing it to finding it distressing. Now there's a few more questions. I don't know if you can see your chat box, Sarah. There are a few more in here. I'll keep reading. Uh, is Goffstown, New Hampshire named for Mr. Goff? I don't know. You better look into it, questioner. You need to know. <laughs> and if you'd like to look at the chat box here, you can see if sure. there's any other cool ones uh, that folks can get an answer for. And thank you so much again. There's a couple here left, yep. Have you considered yeah, why is it named Three Judges Cave? Good point, because Dixel was never in that cave. Why was my father embarrassed? I, I, I. That's a really good question, and I read the book. I, I try to puzzle that one out. My, my book is called Regicide in the Family. People are asking that. Um. Yeah. I'm glad that, that you got things out of it. Thank you for telling me that. Um, is there anything else? To whom will I give the key? I don't know. I have two kids and now I have two grandkids. Yeah. Thank you, Beverly Harrison. Uh, yeah, well, I've got to come down and visit that cave. <laughs> yeah. This person is saying, I hope you were a little pleased that there is some rebel and successful anarchistic blood in your gene pool. <laughs> I believe that Charles was far worse than Davenport. I, I think so. I mean, so many people died during Charles's reign. It was really terrible. And he, he just, apparently he just had no idea how to compromise. He just had to be right. There was a, there's this wonderful podcast out of England called, um, I think it's called The Rest is, the Rest is History. And it, they were on the January 30th, which was the day that Charles was beheaded. They had historians duking it out. Was it a stupid thing to do, the regicide, or was it a great thing to do? And they're still fighting about it and talking about it every minute in England. It's, it's wonderful how interested they are. They still have the National Day of Mourning. People put wreaths at the foot of Charles's statue in London on January 30th every year. They have not forgotten. Should I see if there's anything else? The Q&A box has a couple. I see Don wants to know, I am under the impression that no regicide was captured, that was captured, was tried, was exonerated. All were hung, drawn, and quartered. Is that true? The ones that, the ones, yeah. I mean, they, they let off a few people who hadn't actually signed the death warrant, but the people who had signed the death warrant were in a lot of trouble. Oh, I see Lucy McDermott, who was my teacher at Harvard. Hey, hi, I wonder if you're still here. Susan Wabuda, yeah. You've been saying wonderful things. They were part of the, oh, one person says the Whaley's were part of the family of Archbishop Thomas Cramer in England. And it's pronounced Wally, Wally. Thank you, British person. 
Uh, oh, so this is Lucy's question. I answered it. Uh, and did you know why Dixwell left Hanau in Germany for Hadley from John Miller? He left Hanau because George Downing, he, there were four of them in Hanau. And George Downing told them, your wives are going to come over to Amsterdam and you can see your wives again. You just come to Amsterdam. And so two of them went to Amsterdam and he nabbed them. They went back to the tower and they were drawn and quartered. So it was after that that John Dixwell somehow, he went, he, first he went to Flanders. There, um, Edmund Ludlow, who was the regicide who was in um, Switzerland, wrote this huge long thing, Voice from the Tower. And he describes how Dixwell was at the burial of Valentine Walton, I think it was, who died in Flanders and was buried in his landlady's garden. And so I sort of pictured Dixwell putting the earth on the coffin of the last regicide that he knew in Germany who hadn't been caught and drawn and quartered. And I bet he just then went to where? Some port on the coast of France and got a boat. Maybe he first went to the Caribbean. I, I looked at ships lists and there were various Dixwells who went to the Caribbean. I'm sure they were all involved in the slave trade and the sugar plantations. It was bad. And somehow, maybe he went to Barbados or someplace like that. And then maybe he went to Boston first, or did he go directly to New Haven? We, we just don't know that stuff. I wish we did. I see a question here from Margaret. Has any research been done on the route of escape beyond West Rock? Henry Bo Brooks moved to what is now Cheshire, Connecticut, named such from his home in England. Does any of that ring a bell for you? Well, I think you should really look at um, Chris Pagliuco's book because he really traced every step of, of where they hid and what they did and who hid them. It was pretty amazing. Like Davenport hid the regicides. I, I, I couldn't, I mean, he was, and the Eaton's um, daughter, I think, was married to a, a Jones whose father, as he was sailing over from England to New Haven, his father was being drawn and quartered because he was was one of the signers of the death warrant. And 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 they sometimes the regicides who were killed would say things like, he they would ask Charles II to please pardon the next regicide and let their life stand in for that. And they they calmly accepted being disemboweled while they were still aware and kept sort of praying through the whole, they were just remarkably calm. They just totally believed that they did what had to be done. They felt that Charles was, they called him that man of blood, which is from the Bible, and that he had blood on his hands and therefore his life had to be taken. So they, they, they did not waver in their conviction that they had done what had to be done. I don't know how long I should be taking questions. Yeah, I'll come on here just to um, come on video here just to tell you thank you again. And Margaret Ann, I don't know if you have any thoughts you want to add. Um, I want to thank everyone for all your awesome comments. And um, I'm going to do a round of applause for you again, Sarah. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for your comments. Thank you so much, Dixie. It's been great. You're welcome. And this will be available on Facebook Live. If anyone missed anything and they want to watch it, it's available now. Uh, it will be on our YouTube channel. I highly recommend you follow our YouTube channel as well. And there are copies, signed copies of Dixie's book here. So do contact Donna at the museum, extension 119, if you'd like a copy. All right. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. I'm have enjoying reading everything in the chat. Can I have a minute to just keep looking at the chat? Yeah, there you are. See, my, my niece was there. Hi, Rebecca. Oh. <laughs> my teacher from Harvard wants me to send a copy of my book to Charles III. I thought that was pretty scary timing that we get Charles III just as my book is coming out. Because the person on the cover of my book is not John Dixwell. We have no image of him. It's Charles I. It's a beautiful portrait of him. Oh, a second cousin who's descended from Dixwell came. Oh, yeah. Is everybody gone now? People are filtering and 
That's about it. So whenever you like, you can always say good night or you can spend a couple more minutes here with your fans and whatever works. John for you. Adams, John Adams said that um, he stopped at Dixlow's grave to pay homage on his travels to the Constitutional Convention. Now that is a wonderful little piece of information. Wow. Thank you very much, Bruce, Bruce Lathrop. I think you're a Dixwell descendant with a last name of Lathrop. Definitely. Okay. Well, I can't possibly do all of these. I wish that I could. All right. Should we sign off? Yes. Well, good night, everyone from the New Hay Museum. Thank you. Thank everybody. you, Margaret. Thank you, Patrick.